So uh, thank you all for coming out here. Uh, first of all, this is an unnatural act to have an academic meeting starting at 8 o'clock. Uh, I am a 10 to 10 guy kind of myself, you know, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, okay, shift work. Um, but uh, so this is a bit of, but this is in deference to our national security colleagues, I think, who feel natural at, you know, O-Dark 30 stand-up meetings, uh, right? You've all, several of you have been there. Uh, so first of all, let me uh, shift over to our, our partner and colleague. Uh, we're, uh, Space Policy Institute is uh, proud of a uh, partnership uh, that we developed uh, with uh, Aerospace Corporation uh, to uh, host uh, this, this kind of event and to uh, stimulate these kind of dialogues uh, within the community. And uh, it's a particular pleasure uh, for me to uh, invite my friend, uh, longtime uh, friend and colleague, uh, Steve Asakowitz, uh, who's now the president and CEO of Aerospace Corporation. You usually thought that you had to be like older and kind of eminent, you know, before you <laughs> had those slots. And this is somebody I've known. I mean, so it's just, it's really cool. And uh, I can't think of a better head for the company. Uh, Steve, please. Uh, thank you, Scott, for that introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to see so many uh, familiar faces and uh, friends uh, in the audience here. Uh, on behalf of the Aerospace Corporation and George Washington University Space Policy Institute, our gracious co-host, uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome you here today for this very important morning discussion. And we are delighted to partner with the Space Policy Institute at the University's Elliott School of International Affairs, um, it's also a delight for me personally to be back here. My wife is actually a graduate of George Washington University, and my son is a graduate of the Space Policy Institute. So a lot of happy memories uh, standing here today. Uh, the Institute is celebrating its 30th year. Uh, the Institute is one of our nation's premier academic centers for research and scholarship on issues related to domestic and international space policy. Uh, before I continue, I want to also uh, mention the fact that I'm delighted that uh, later this morning we're going to have Representative Brian Babin here as the keynote. I look forward to that. I also want to welcome our distinguished panelists, uh, including the uh, Honorable Michael Donnelly, the, sec the 22nd Secretary of the Air Force and Vice Chair of the Aerospace Corporation's Board of Trustees. Mike, thank you so much for being here. And also the all-star cast we have of panelists this morning. Uh, a number of which I've had a chance to uh, work with during the times at the White House. And I gotta say, nothing evokes more war stories at the bar than someone you've worked together in the trenches to develop space policy. So look forward to that. Finally, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Jamie Morin uh, for his strong leadership and role in making this event possible. Um, Jamie joined the Aerospace Corporation in March of this year as the Vice President of the Defense Systems Operations in the Defense Systems Group. He's also the Executive Director for the Center for Space Policy and Strategy and boasts an impressive record of prior service in the U.S. Department of Defense and in the Air Force. As I was putting together my thoughts for today's conference, I came across an anniversary that probably few outside of our field have paid any attention to. On this day in 1965, the Mariner 4 spacecraft sailed past Mars. It was not only the first successful flyby of the Red Planet, but the pictures it took were the first images of another planet retrieved from deep space. In many ways, the Mariner spacecraft was aptly named. Space is like an ocean. From a distance, it seems a peaceful sanctuary. But the further one ventures into either direction, the more apparent its dangers become. And like the ocean, space has become a contested domain with the advancement of humanity. Given these similarities, we can look briefly back upon the history of sea conquest to inform our approach to space and help forge discrete space policy. In the early 1880s, a U.S. naval commander stationed in Peru during the War of the Pacific between Chile, Peru, and Bolivia was inspired to formulate his ideas about the importance of global sea power. According to some accounts, he was a less than ideal operational leader. Several of his ships were involved in collisions with moving and stationary objects. <laughs> and he tried to avoid active sea duty. This commander was Alfred Thayer Mahan. So why am I telling you about this bungler who could have given Captain Jack Sparrow a run for his treasure chest? Mahan was a brilliant strategist, and he would go on to write what many considered to be the definitive work on ocean supremacy titled The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Mahan's book chronicled European sea battles of the 17th and 18th centuries and also, also detailed his thoughts on strategy and tactics. 
In short, this visionary believed that whoever ruled the seas ruled the world. His book quickly became so influential that it served as the Bible for virtually every major world power of this day. It even fueled a naval arms race that led up to World War I. From ancient Athens to the British Empire, whoever commanded the seas did indeed command the world. In this era, to be a true space, to be a true world power, a nation must still be a dominant naval power. The same is becoming true for space, and there may come a time when those who rule space command significant influence over the world. This is why the work of the Aerospace Corporation Center for Space Policy and Strategy is more important than ever. The center is home to an unrivaled group of objective, nonpartisan experts who use our nearly 60 years of experience to provide authoritative analysis and promote informed, insightful, and technically sound space policy. It is a wellspring of thoughtful policy papers, including works examining the international aspects of debris remediation in the Outer Space, space, uh, space Treaty. The center is also a vibrant nexus for the community to gather for educational seminars, invitational networking forums, and panel discussions. In addition to today's prestigious keynote speaker, we will host two dynamic panels. In the first panel, we will define today's problems and challenges, including the democratization of space and the crowded field of players emerging, the arrival of technological game changers, and the complexity of harnessing technology, economic forces, and policy to achieve various goals. In the second panel, we will identify the opportunities for leadership and institutional solutions, such as the impact of the impending recreation of the National Space Council on the entire space community, especially in an era of increasing intersection of federal agencies. Congressional NDAA legislation being voted upon directing the Air Force to start a Space Corps, and how to bridge the gap between the Air Force and the Hill over how best to manage space. This event is an open discussion. We welcome everyone's insights and feedback. Our hope is to take these complex issues and make them easily accessible to everyone. The stakes are simply too high for anyone to be left out of this conversation. In that spirit, the center will continue to host events that highlight the evolving challenges to the space enterprise. And we will continue to explore how we best can support our nation's effort to retain leadership in space as it undergoes a historic transformation. One late 19th century naval officer and his definitive book changed the course of the seas. So just imagine how these discussions and the vital work of the Center for Space Policy and Strategy and GW Space Policy Institute will influence policy prescriptions and ultimately the destination of space and humanity. Thank you again for being here today and let's move into our first panel. And with that, I'm excited to see where our conversation leads us and delighted to introduce uh, Scott Pace, who uh, also is he. Well, I want to thank uh, Scott and the panelists. I think that was a great discussion. We could have gone a lot longer. I saw a lot of uh, interested hands go up. I, I will share one anecdote that I think is a good segue from our first panel to our keynote speaker. Um, when I first joined the Office of Management and Budget, I was on the job for one week. And I had one responsibility, which was to do some work on NASA's space station program. And I was there one week when the House Appropriations Subcommittee zeroed out all funding for the space station. What was interesting for me at that time is that was during the time of uh, uh, President uh, George H.W. Bush, and there was a space council. And there's an old Mike Tyson uh, expression that uh, um, nothing um, undoes strategy like the first punch in the face. Well, that was the punch in the face, and it actually forced through the Space Council and the White House at that moment to decide where are we really on our space program. To me, it was also a big lesson learned of the perils that you play with regards to developing space policy that does not take into account the wishes and the concerns of the Congress. And it wasn't something we didn't have a chance to get into with our first panel, but I think through our keynote speaker here, it's a great chance to hear his thoughts on that. And we are fortunate to have that man in the person of the Honorable Brian Babin, a representative of the 36th District of Texas. Uh, Dr. Babin currently serves on the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology and is the chairman of the House Subcommittee on Space 
and has a huge say in the direction and ambitions we have for America's space program. A son of East Texas, he is also a veteran. He earlier served in U.S. Army Reserve and also held a commission as a captain in the U.S. Air Force in Germany after finishing dental school. After his Air Force service, Dr. Babin returned home to East Texas, where years later he ran for Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome U.S. Congressman Brian Babin. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to uh, tell you how much I appreciate uh, being here and being invited to speak to you. Uh, you have a fantastic agenda plan, I can see that. Uh, we all know of our accomplishments in space. Overseas, we have no insight into their innovative technologies or operations, and it would compromise our national security. The same thing can be said about future space capabilities like satellite servicing, habitations, modules, and asteroid mining. But this promise is threatened. Threatened by expansive unchecked regulatory authority, cumbersome non-transparent regulatory processes, and misperceptions about the United States outer space treaty obligations. For several years, the Space Subcommittee has heard concerns from stakeholders who need greater regulatory certainty to attract investment and to succeed. Stakeholders also reported that while they want to stay in America, they might need to go overseas due to regulatory burdens and uncertainty. If we implement burdensome domestic laws and regulations, we do so at our own peril. Companies can choose to incorporate, manufacture, and operate in any country in the, around the world. If we fail in any of, these endeavor, any of these efforts, I fear that we may be relegated to a contributing role rather than a leading role in space. This would compromise our national security, our economic competitiveness, and stature in the international community. If we are vigilant in our efforts to uphold the principles that I have just mentioned, then I am confident that the United States will enjoy a healthy private sector in space and play a leadership role on the frontiers of space. And for these reasons, the Science, Space, and Technology Committee recently passed by voice vote and with broad bipartisan co-sponsorship and support the American Space Commerce Free Enterprise Act. This bill places the responsibility to authorize and supervise private space activities to assure compliance with outer space treaty obligations at the Office of Space Commerce and the Department of Commerce. There are a number of reasons why placing this responsibility at DOC is a good long-term decision for the United States and for our industry. DOC's culture is more aligned with space activities than DOT's. The mission statement of DOC is to create the conditions for economic growth and opportunity, and that mission runs deep through the culture of the Commerce Department. Placing this authority at DOC establishes a one-stop shop for the Outer Space Treaty compliance and places the authority in an agency that embraces innovation and technology. Placing authority at DOC also consolidates bureaucracy by merging the DOC Office of Space Commerce and the NOAA Office of Commercial Space Sensing Regulatory Affairs reforming the current broken space-based remote sensing regulatory process and minimizing the burden on other agencies. This bill provides for presumptions of approval and requires the government to take affirmative steps before conditioning or denying proposed space or remote sensing operations. It places the burden of demonstrating inconsistency with outer space treaty obligations and national security requirements of the United States with the government and not with the applicant. It curtails vague, overreaching regulatory authority and prevents tolling of statutory adjudication timelines. It ensures U.S. industry receives a timely and transparent determination on all applications. The bill recognizes legitimate national security equities, and it provides 
for the condition or denial of authorized space activities with remote sensing systems that are a significant threat to U.S. national security in certain circumstances. <clears throat> but it protects against abuses of interagency discretion by requiring an explanation and evidence of a threat before conditions or denial can be made. I expect that the House of Representatives will approve the measure as soon as the busy floor calendar will permit. Moving on from legal and regulatory issues, now let me turn to another challenge, and that is a political will. Space exploration is expensive, folks, and the taxpayer is faced with other competing priorities. Political support of space exploration is not guaranteed. Following the success of Apollo, America retreated and focused on developing low Earth orbit with the space shuttle, but not after a multi-year gap in access to space. We're currently in a similar situation. After the Columbia accident, we realized that we should develop a safer vehicle than the space shuttle, and this led to a planned phase out of the shuttle program and the corresponding development of Constellation. And after the attempted cancellation of Constellation, Consensus developed around the concept of developing the Space Launch System and Orion for deep space and the Commercial Crew Program for low Earth orbit. Until these programs launch, we remain dependent upon Russia uh, to get us up to the International Space Station. Future generations should learn from these mistakes and recognize the strategic value of maintaining uninterrupted access to space. Even though space is expensive and there are other priorities competing for the same taxpayer funding, we cannot afford not to invest in space. Those investments require continued political will, which we should not take for granted. Finally, another challenge that we will face going forward is stovepiping. Half a century ago, the U.S. decided uh, to separate its civil and military space programs to ensure that space exploration was carried out for peaceful purposes only. This was and remains a laudable goal. And it has allowed uh, for the establishment of international partnerships that have brought nations together for the shared goal of peaceful exploration. It has facilitated transparency and it has engendered goodwill from other nations. For these reasons, we should continue to keep our civil and national security space programs separate, but we should also try to find efficiencies as well. As budgets shrink, costs rise, and debts increase, we should identify opportunities where both sectors have shared goals. Launch vehicles, spacecraft buses, optics, sensors, ground infrastructure should all be synergized. The national security community should maximize the assets that the civil space community has developed, and vice versa. The same should be said about the commercial sector. If each community fails to find these efficiencies, costs will grow and opportunities will remain hidden in the shadows. Last month, I flew back uh, to Johnson Space Center with Vice President Pence to announce the new class of astronauts. There were 12 of them. Two weeks ago, I was again with Vice President when he and President Trump announced the reconstitution of the National Space Council. Already authorized into law, the Space Council could address many of the stovepiping issues. And there are certainly many issues that could benefit from an across-the-board review. And I also want to con uh, congratulate you on the announcement that we, we heard. Scott, congratulations. The most obvious issue that could benefit from National Space Council attention is our nation's space transportation portfolio. The Department of Defense's evolved expendable launch vehicle fleet, including their efforts to replace the RD-180 engine for national security missions, as well as NASA's development operation of the commercial cargo program, and the development of the commercial crew program and the space launch system could all benefit from a holistic assessment. DOD and NASA have different requirements, so it's logical that they would have different vehicles, but there are opportunities to better align the two agency activities. For instance, SLS provides a wide fairing capable of launching large optics and arrays. Similarly, 
Efforts at both DOD and NASA on small class launch vehicles could benefit for better coordination. A similar sector that the Council could explore is satellite servicing. NASA's Restore-L program and DARPA, DARPA's uh, uh, RSGS program are focused on very similar goals. Coordinating and deconflicting these activities seems like a logical role for the Council. Another opportunity for coordination is weather. After the cancellation of the National Polar Orbiting Environmental Satellite System because of bureaucratic failures, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration took on the responsibility of providing weather data in the afternoon orbit. The European partners were to provide data in the mid-morning orbit, and the Department of Defense was to provide weather data uh, in the um, early evening orbit. Uh, and while NOAA has held up its end of the deal and is poised to launch the first joint polar satellite system mission this fall, DOD still has not decided how it will satisfy its obligation. There is no guarantee that DOD will include visible infrared imaging radiometer suite, or VIRS, which was more of a DOD priority than it was a NOAA priority before the breakup of the original program. And given the significant investment in developing VIRS, it would be a shame if DOD did not live up to its end of the bargain and fly VIRS. As it stands, the civil space sector is essentially subsidizing national security space, but not receiving reciprocal support. The National Space Council could provide a forum to address weather issues like this that span agency operations. Another issue that spans agencies is space weather. Just like traditional weather, space weather observations involve many agencies. NASA conducts heliophysics research within space observations. The National Space Foundation conducts ground-based operations and supports basic research. The DOD and NOAA conduct space weather observations and forecasts to protect U.S. government assets. The Department of Energy, the Department of Transportation, and DHS are also interested in understanding the state of space weather because of its risk to our power grid, aviation, and homeland security. Given the multitude of agencies involved in space weather, there is another opportunity for the National Space Council to de demonstrate leadership through clarifying agency roles and responsibilities to prevent duplication and ensure efficiency. In addition to traditional weather and space weather monitoring, another topic ripe for National Space Council's attention is space situational awareness. Knowing where objects are in space is absolutely critical to not only government operators like DOD, NASA, and NOAA, but also to the private sector. I'd like to take the opportunity now to highlight some of the issues that the National Space Council and Congress will have to evaluate with SSA. There is currently no consensus on what, if anything, the federal government should do about SSA going forward. But there are many different ideas that are being discussed. Frankly, this is a very good thing. This is a serious issue and we must get it right. Department of Defense and Joint Space Operations Center are advocating the responsibilities to be transferred from the DOD to a civilian federal agency. The bottom line is that DOD does not want to use resources on non-military SSA functions. This is legitimate, a legitimate concern on their part. However, the degree to which DOD resources are being taxed remains an open question and hard to determine. The DOD will always have to maintain SSA capabilities to protect our national security. What is uncertain, however, is that the level of effort uh, devoted to commercial, uh, is it a level of effort devoted to a commercial storefront? Would transferring authority to a civilian agency actually save money? How would this impact international cooperation and space operations security? The Obama administration advocated for a civil, uh, a civil agency, specifically the Department of Transportation, to take over DOD's responsibilities but we should also explore other uh, options and possibilities. 
Are there superior solutions that do not involve the FAA or another civil agency taking over DOD responsibilities? If Congress decides a civil agency should have a role, should NASA or the Department of Commerce be responsible instead for the FAA, instead of the FAA? The Department of Commerce is currently the only agency authorized to regulate activities in space, and NASA already plays a significant role in JSBOX mission. NASA also has its own SSA activities at Goddard uh, and Johnson Space, uh, uh, Space Center. It's important to note that the Obama administration also advocated for the FAA to not only provide SSA information and services, but also to regulate on-orbit activities. The FAA argues that if granted authority to provide SSA information and services, already coupled with existing statutory authority to protect public health and safety, safety of property, national security interests, and foreign policy interests, that would be sufficient for the FAA to promulgate regulations governing on-orbit safety of flight operations. The FAA has been publicly advocating for a crawl, walk, run approach. In this analogy, the FAA says that crawling is providing SSA information and services. Walking is facilitating standards and best practices, and running is regulating only when necessary. But the FAA's proposal would give the FAA authority to regulate before it, is de it has demonstrated the ability to provide SSA information and services and before the creation of standards and best practices. Should we allow the FAA to regulate on orbit, orbit safety of flight before it has demonstrated an absolute public necessity for such regulations? Should Congress let the FAA run before it has crawled? As the old saying goes, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And when you're a regulatory agency, every problem can be fixed by regulation. And in principle, I'm against this type of regulatory expansion. Only if the public interest cannot otherwise be met with other means should we expand regulatory authority and infringe upon our citizens' rights and liberty. The private sector, including for-profit entities, not-for-profit entities, associations, and academia, also have a stake in this discussion, both as users and also as providers of SSA and STM information and services. Several years ago, operators founded the Space Data Association, a private organization that has been very successful in attracting membership and improving safer flight profiles on orbit. And while not a panacea, the Space Data Association demonstrates how the private sector can successfully collaborate and innovate STM solutions without government intervention. They have been so successful that several federal agencies have joined the Space Data Association, including NASA and NOAA. A number of commercial companies are investing in and operating ground and space-based SSA infrastructure, observing software and processing capabilities. Information and services are for sale on the open market. Companies are competing to develop more cost-effective, timely and accurate SSA data, often relying on off-the-shelf and non-military technologies. In some cases, commercial capabilities and analytics are superior to DODs. That is very good news for America and for our global community. There are also academic institutions and nonprofit entities innovating and contributing to improved SSA information and services. Academic institutions have been forward-leaning with proposals for open source SSA data solutions and advocating for a hybrid public-private partnership solution to address the safety of on-orbit flight operations. And we should stoke the embers of private sector creativity, not smother them with a bureaucratic blanket. As I reflect upon all these different stakeholders, I do see some commonality. First, there's a general consensus that we should enhance the safety of space operations and ensure the environment is available for future use. Second, we lack an agreed upon metric to define success. To what degree are we to enhance safety and preserve the environment? Without a way to tell, 
We risk chasing after the horizon and crafting policies that are not appropriately bound. Third, there's a recognition that the U.S. is not alone in this. We face an international challenge. Let us not forget that the U.S. leads the world in promoting safety of flight and preservation of the space environment. And the U.S. space debris mitigation is a regulated activity. FAA, FCC, and NOAA licenses are all required to conform to U.S. space debris mit uh, mitigation guidelines. The federal agencies are also supposed to conform to U.S. space debris mitigation guidelines. And furthermore, U.S. space debris mitigation guidelines are complemented with international debris guidelines, providing an international coordination mechanism, a mechanism for standards and best practices. Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, the Space Shuttle, the International Space Station, rovers on Mars, Hubble, Voyager, Cassini, Kepler, go on and the list goes on and on. The United States has an incredible history of achievement and, ex and leadership in space exploration. The accomplishments of our past, however, do not guarantee our leadership in the future. We continue to face challenges to our exploration. Part of what makes spaceflight rewarding is that it is hard. Despite our best efforts, the truth is that there will always be potential setbacks uh, that will test our resolve. Launch vehicles will fail, landers will crash, rovers will break down, spacecraft will not operate, budgets will shrink, hopefully not much, programs will be canceled, Management will change. Priorities will shift. Our success is not guaranteed. There will be challenges that threaten the success of our space enterprise. For 50 years, our progress in space was driven by our competition with the Soviet Union. Going forward, we will be motivated by curiosity and commerce. Humanity's push into the cosmos and the realization of a vibrant, standalone space economy will depend upon how we respond uh, to all of these challenges. For instance, how we uh, view risk will directly impact our future. If we retreat to an overly conservative posture and shy away from calculated risks, we could end up ceding our leadership to those who are willing to be bolder than we are. This isn't to say that we should be careless or cavalier. That too would lead to failure. As past accidents like Challenger and Columbia proved, the American public expects diligence and finding the right balance for risk is absolutely critical. Another challenge that we will face is that of market corruption. Half a century ago, space was the, very, the sole province of nation states. The private sector built and operated systems for the government, but ultimately, the taxpayer provided the funding for space. Since the dawn of the space age, this construct has evolved slightly. Private capital is beginning to make bets into, on space. From communications and remote sensing satellites to launch vehicles and potentially habitats and mining, there is a great deal of promise for commercial space. The challenge that government faces is how to support these activities without artificially influencing the market forces necessary for a long-term viability of the private sector space economy. It's not surprising that the private sector wants public sector support and its funding. These private-public partnerships can come in many forms. The appropriateness of these partnerships depends upon the government's needs and the current state of the private sector. For instance, if the government has a need for a capability that does not exist, there's little uh, or no private sector demand for a service, the government may have to place a greater stake in that endeavor to gain access to that capability. This should result in a typical cost plus federal acquisition regulation based contract where the government pays a contractor to, to develop a capability on its behalf. And similarly, if the government needs a capability that is already available on the market, the government should procure that good or service using a FAR-based firm fixed price contract. Public-private partnerships offer opportunities for the situations in between these two extremes where capabilities do not yet exist in the private sector, but where the private sector could find other customers 
to offset the government's costs. NASA and DOD have used public-private partnerships in the past with varied results. The DOD's Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle Program was developed with 80% of the funding from the private sector. Boeing and Lockheed were willing to invest a great deal of their own money to develop the Atlas V and the Delta IV launch vehicles because the projected market for commercial communication satellite launches in the late 90s and early 2000s was promising at that point in time. Ultimately, the ambitious launch rates never materialized. But the program still ended up producing two separate launch vehicles at a very reasonable price. Another example that SSA information and services are a public good or an inherently government, governmental function. The private sector provides SSA information and services and has done so for years. Therefore, it should not be assumed to be an inherently governmental service. The real question is whether it is an inherently governmental function to ensure that operators have actionable SSA data of appropriate fidelity. Another related question centers on who should bear the costs of SSA uh, and STM. Should the taxpayer subsidize the data and services for space operators? Should operators be responsible either via fees levied by the government or through private markets to cover the costs? The implications of this choice go beyond simply who will pay for a service. It also raises questions of liability and incentives for space operators to improve upon SSA and to ensure safer on-orbit flight profiles. If the government provides a service, does it disincentivize responsible behavior by the private sector and create a so-called moral hazard? By limiting liability for either the public or private sector, are we incentivizing risk-taking? Outer space and orbital regimes that we all rely upon should be managed appropriately and available for use by future generations. But if we fail to provide a competitive environment for private sector innovation and investment, other nations will happily step forward into the gap. Outer space is not airspace. It is not territorial waters. There is no sovereign territory in outer space. If we, don't, if we do adopt a burdensome regulatory structure, commercial space operators will decide to work with other nations, more permissive countries. This will lead to an eroded domestic industrial base, decreased national capabilities, declining international influence, and the loss of a skilled workforce. And I hope that that does not happen. If appropriately constituted, the National Space Council can provide a leadership role in synergizing not only space situational awareness, but many of the other cross-cutting policy issues that I have mentioned earlier. In order to be effective, other executive branch agencies and executive offices like the Office of Management and Budget, the National Security Council, and the Office of Science and Technology Policy will have to go along and respect the direction provided by the Council. If the council does not get that buy-in, then I, 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 I do worry that it could simply become simply another layer of bureaucracy. And having spent time with Vice President Pence on the campaign trail and over the last six months of his office, I believe that he will lead the council in a manner that advances our nation's entire space enterprise. Our country faces many challenges, but I have hope. The future is very bright. I'm very optimistic. Space still benefits from broad bipartisan support. Outside of defense and security departments, the administration's budget request favored NASA more than any other agency. The House Appropriations Committee went even further by proposing $20 billion more for NASA. We are making great progress on national programs like the Space Launch System and Orion, which will soon propel mankind farther into the cosmos than ever before. We stand ready to return launching U.S. astronauts on U.S. rockets from soil, once, U.S. soil, once again. We're making phenomenal progress on next generation in-space propulsion technologies that will get us to Mars and beyond. In fact, we had in-space propulsion hearing two weeks ago that was very, very interesting. Exoplanet discoveries are now commonplace. 
The James Webb Space Telescope promises to unlock many of the universe's mysteries and rewrite the textbooks. And with advancements in reusability and affordability, the promise of a truly private sector space economy is within our reach. We truly live in amazing times. The next generation stands ready to inherit this awe-inspiring future, and I'm very confident the next, that the next 50 years will be just as amazing as the last 50 years. So I'm going to wrap this long marathon speech up and say thank you so much for your attention, and thank you for inviting me here. God bless you, God bless our, our country, and God bless our space program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. cargo program. NASA was also able to, to develop two separate launch vehicles, but this time the government paid for roughly half of both vehicles' development costs. Unlike the expected private sector demand for launching telecommunications satellites, launching cargo for the ISS was viewed as having limited commercial applications outside of NASA, and therefore the government would have to bear more of the development costs. NASA still required the contractors to have, a, have significant skin in the game, as former administrator Mike Griffith put it. Still further, NASA's commercial crew program is almost entirely funded by NASA. Roughly 10% at the most comes from contractors. The rationale for the disproportionate investment was that there was such a small market for commercial human spaceflight at the time it was used, inc if used incorrectly, the public support of private sector space activities could actually inhibit and stifle private sector innovation by funding activities that either the private sector would have funded on its own or that are not yet worthy of investment. And while this support may be attractive and even beneficial, at first, continued subsidies or development funding could undermine the long-term viability of the space economy by corrupting normal market forces. I see monopolies as another element of market corruption. As we have seen in the past, monopolies can increase cost and stifle innovation. We should also be cautious of outsourcing all of our strategic space activities to the private sector. Government should be limited to only those functions that are necessary and constitutional and that they do well. Operations to, in, and from space are certainly necessary. We should leverage the private sector to the greatest extent possible and appropriate, but we must carefully guard against subjecting our national interest to the uncertainty of marketplace. Companies come and companies go. We must ensure that any cooperation between the public and the private sectors does not lead to dependence or to monopoly that could undermine our national security or our national interests. Somewhat related to market challenges are, are another risk, laws and regulation. Regulatory bureaucracy is a huge problem, and as a conservative Republican, we fight that every day. But in order to assure a vibrant space economy, we have to make the U.S. an attractive place to do business. We can do this by keeping the regulatory burden low ensuring that property rights are guaranteed, offering an attractive tax structure, and ensuring that the rule of law is upheld. The Science, Space, and Technology Committee cares very deeply about these principles, I can assure you. For over a decade, the committee has maintained a moratorium on the development of commercial human spaceflight regulations, 
When Scale Composites won the Ansari X Prize in 2004, everyone thought that private sector crude launches would be commonplace in the next 10 years and that we would be able to, de to develop a robust understanding of these new systems that would inform a regulatory process. Unfortunately, the realization of private human spaceflight has not materialized as fast as we had planned. And that slow progress meant that industry and the government hasn't benefited from additional data. The committee has time and again prevented the promulgation of human spaceflight regulations without data. Similarly, the committee has conducted rigorous oversight of the government's efforts to regulate commercial remote sensing. The Land Remote Sensing Act established a regulatory structure to oversee commercial remote sensing. That law required applications to be adjudicated in 120 days. Unfortunately, applications have been held up by the government for over three years without any explanation. And this has forced companies and even entire industries like synth uh, synthetic aperture radio radar to go overseas in search of more transparent and pre uh, predictable regulatory structures. This failed regulatory process costs America high-skilled jobs, tax revenue, and most importantly, leadership. Also, when companies go